What's going on, High Society? Welcome back to GPS Tracking, episode 38, your podcast for everything you need to know about the global Pokemon Society and all things Pokemon. Brand new format premiering this week, so bear with me as we get used to it. Gonna work some stuff out over the next few weeks, but we'll get it. Got a lot of fun stuff for you this podcast. We got interviews. Ali, Mighty Psyduck is gonna be on. Juan the Worcester Deli Birds and Katie of the Denver Ninetales and we got a great hot takes debate between Justin of the Australia Arbox and Drew the Daytona Colossals so you definitely want to check those out but next up let's take a look at where we stand in the league all right taking a look at the minor leagues first we got the Southside Slow Kings as the lone undefeated team Make sure you check out Dre Guy down below, Brian. He's a good guy. He knows what he's doing. I expect he'll be up in the majors before too long. Then we got a few two-in-one teams. Florida, Slateport City, and the Diamond Desert Dwellers all doing really well. The Gardner Gyarados, the Australia Arbucks, and the Worcester Wobbuffets all with one win. And then Daytona is sitting at the bottom 0-3, but there's still four weeks left. So we'll have to see if they can turn it around. The Miners, I'm hoping a lot of the coaches learn stuff. I'm learning a lot about the Miners and how I want to change it for next season. Right now it's kind of too late to do that, but I know I'm definitely interested in seeing what's going on and how I can make it a better learning experience and help everybody. But let's take a look at the meat and potatoes of the society, the Majors. All right, so we got a lot of stuff going on with the majors. Halfway through the season now, you see your Boston Braviaries as the lone 4-0 team doing what we did last season, not losing in the regular season. Then we got a slew, a bevy, a cornucopia of 3-1 teams. Denver, who has a super high differential, check that out. I'm scared of them, got to face them in week 7, so we'll definitely be looking out for them. Charm City at 3-1, and one. Miami also 3-1, and one. Pittsburgh only behind on game wins, the mighty Psyducks, El Paso who just had to get a forfeit win against Tuscaloosa, so that's why their differ differential is so low. But 3-1 is a great spot. Uh, all those 3-1 teams, all they need is a couple more wins. And they're basically guaranteed for the playoffs. So they just got to go 2-2 two two the rest of the way to get in there. Now we go down to our 2-2 two two teams. We got a few. PSG sitting at 2-2, two two, but with a nice differential. Reno 2-2 two and, two, and LA at 2-2. Two two. Then we got a few 1-1 one one teams. Looking at Driftvale, Minnesota. They're still within striking distance if they can rattle off a few wins. Tuscaloosa, unfortunately, with that forfeit loss this week, plummets way down. They're just ahead of Barrow due to beating them early in the season, but a virtual tie. And then the two 0 4 teams, Tokyo and Sin City. So definitely a lot of stuff to look at there. Let's take a look at the schedule coming up for this week so here you see we got Boston and Minnesota coming up Charm City and Paris Denver and Reno I think that'll be a good one Reno last season's runner-up Dripvale and Sin City one of these teams has got to turn it around so this will be a key game for both of them El Paso and Miami El Paso's got a really tough schedule the rest of the way, if you kind of look at it. L.A. and Tuscaloosa. Will Tuscaloosa actually play this week? We'll have to find out. Then we got Miami and Vero. Pittsburgh and Tokyo to round it out. So definitely a few good games. Let me know down below which games you're most looking forward to and what teams you're rooting for now that we're at the halfway point what teams do you think have a shot making the playoffs 
going for the championship and which teams maybe those one and three teams which do you think are most likely to turn around let me know down below but that's our look at the society for this week let's get into some interviews with the coaches hello viewers welcome to global pokemon society interview today we're interviewing the man the myth the heart of the society ali head coach the mighty side of quack quack ali. how's it going everyone yes ali you've been with the society as long as anybody you have done nothing but lose and lose and lose and sometimes win but mostly lose and this season you are the cinderella story currently three and one doing very well for yourself three game win streak so question number one what's been the key to your turnaround this season what what do you attribute it to uh first and foremost i'd be lying if i said uh was a drift fail is the one that called me the I will never forget the laughing stock of the society. I was ready to put my mitts on. I was ready to go that day. I'm a I'm a super competitive person and it's not that I wasn't taking it serious before. It was just kind of like, you know, it's just goofing around playing some Pokemon on a Sunday afternoon kind of thing. It wasn't like wasn't hyper competitive about it really. Just like just enjoy myself, get to keep in touch with you. But then someone said that, started chirping with that. And the switch went off of my brain, like, you know what? F this. <laughs> I'm going to at least, like, try and get aggressive with it. And then, I don't know, something clicked. This team uh, works out really well for me because it is a it's a very simple team. I was saying to you before we started, it's uh, like the 2007 San Antonio Spurs. Very meat and potatoes offense. Not a lot of craziness going on. Not Nothing confusing going on. It's very simple. It's hard hitting. And you're going to probably know what's coming, but it's up to you to stop what's coming. That's a tricky part. So that's what's made the difference for me. But shout out to Drift Fail. You, uh, you pissed me off pretty good, bud. <laughs> there you go. That's all it took. It's all love, though. It's all love. Right. I'm happy. <laughs> I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I can't wait to face him, though. Yeah, for sure. You'll be facing him in a couple weeks. Hopefully, uh, you know, you're still winning out. Um, you probably only need another win or two to guarantee playoffs at this point. But you, you're Sick. definitely like in a good position. But um, Ali, do you remember though after? So you lost the first game this season before you've gone this forward win streak. You actually asked me if you know you wanted me to kick you out. You 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 felt that down. Do you, do you feel like now that you can kind of stand on your own here and that you know you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I get you completely. Uh, no, I no longer feel that way. I was kind of, I was feeling a little sorry for myself. And then, like, I want this league. I mean, you're my buddy. So anything you do, I want to be successful. So I was like, hey, Ryan's really giving it his all to make the GPS, like, a formidable league. And we got the social media with the YouTube. And I wanted to do well. And I was, like, starting to feel like everyone's really solid and really knows their stuff. And I felt like the, like, the weak link, like, I didn't want to be the one to take away credibility from the rest of the league. So, I mean, you were very gracious and, you know, reassuring, and I appreciated that. So I was like, yeah, keep trying. And then, short, like, a few days after that, the infamous Discord comment happened, and I was like, that was all the fire I needed between just you, like, reassuring me and then the comment. I was ready to try, and then it clicked with this team. For whatever reason, this team just makes sense to me. So going forward, I'm not saying I'm going to win out or anything, no predictions, but I definitely feel like I at least understand what my goal is. Whether or not it works out every game, who knows, but I at least know. I, this is the first time in a year where I kind of am not just turning on my switch and being like, eh, it's, it's, you know, fire, fire burns grass. Let's start with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's now I'm actually kind of have an idea in my head of what I want to try and do. So it, it, things are clicking now, for sure. There you go. Well, like, like I said, huge turnaround for you. So, with that said, do do you feel like you're putting in any extra like prep time this season compared to the past? Like, do you like take a look at like what your opponent um, could bring and therefore like 
decide where you're gonna bring sort of stuff or like you said kind of meet and pairs are you just like okay this pokemon this, this core works i'm just gonna throw it at them and have my opponent have to take the time to try and stop it honestly i wish i had um time to like practice more i mean you know what i do it's yeah. there's no predictability with the schedule retail is very difficult to kind of allot that time and then sometimes when you're walking in the house last thing you want to do is turn anything on you just want to chill out so i haven't necessarily been practicing i have picked up the switch and played a little bit but not like grinding really but definitely more than in the past i never this is a little competitive edge I, I never, ever check matchups with anyone. I know what I'm going to do. I know how I'm going to try and do it. And, I mean, you just try and stop me, I guess. That's the best way I could put it. Is Because uh, I don't want to overthink it. Because <laughs> I'm very superstitious. And thus far, it's been working for me to do it like this. I mean, I could lose out for the rest of the season. I, I'll consider this a success. I've had a blast. I'm having fun with this team. But... Yeah, no, no, no extra um, homework necessarily. I just have, this is the first time mainly that I've just had a vision of how I want to play this team. Awesome. So what, what kind of Pokemon would you say are your standouts this season that have kind of like brought your team together? First and foremost, Aerodactyl is just the, the rock slide. That's, I, I don't, it's not a move I like, ever really considered to be like that formidable like but it's just perfect for doubles it is mainly um what i found is i'm taking out two opponents at once um it's it's putting them behind the eight ball a little bit where you know i got i might get a ko on one and then the other one's just halfway down you know i think that's giving me a competitive edge with the rock slide and the dual wing be those two particular moves with the aerodactyl and um Venusaur is just, um, he was kind of the, the bright spot on my team last season. Um, but now it's G-Max Venusaur, and that's just helped me uh, just a huge, huge uh, with the Max, uh, what is it, G-Max Vine Lash? Yep. Okay. Yeah, Vine Lash. <laughs> I don't even know the moves. <laughs> yeah. All those G-Max moves, the Vine Lash, the Wildfire, the... Uh... Hydro cannon, all those that add the residual damage, like over the course of the game, that kills like a Pokemon and a half, basically. Yeah, it does, and that's does so much damage. The residual damage after the fact has been huge for me. So those two, uh, Aerodactyl with the Rock Slide taking out at least one opponent, and then doing big damage to the person, the Pokemon next to him, and then the G Max Vine Lash with the residual damage. And then um, Sylveon's been solid for me, which I wasn't necessarily, I didn't know what to expect out of him. Um, then Regirock. Yeah, I like my team a whole bunch. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you're doing a great job this season, Ollie. Anything you want to add uh, to your fans, maybe to uh, some of your early skeptics now that you've turned it around? Uh, my early skeptics, uh, just keep it coming. I mean, eventually I just, I'm somebody who, uh, who, uh, gets fueled. Uh, they puts a fire in my belly. Any, any, anything Look, like that. I'm on the bulletin board, right? Uh, exactly. I'm, like... I'm hyper competitive. Uh, Kobe Bryant's my favorite athlete of all time. So there's the mama mentality. You just stay focused. You stay sharp and it helps me do that. So. I appreciate it. I appreciate it more than applause, to be honest with you. And somebody says something bad. <laughs> um, and, and to all my fans, I just I'm happy if I can entertain you in any way, whether it's a, a stupid giggle or like how much of a novice I am that somehow is kind of pulling wins out of my uh, my tail end, if you will. Um, just thank you for uh, thank you for appreciating what I do. It, it's uh, really humbling to have people like uh, the Australia are bots man like hopefully it's a man yeah, right justin's great <laughs> yeah no he's so super nice so i've gotten to meet cool people like that have been like really supportive and cheering me on it's been like really humbling to have people just i've never met be nice and like root for me it's really cool which is one of the highlights about doing this league is you meet cool people and you play some video games and uh that's what we're all here for at the end of the day it's just have a good time meet some people and just chill i like it that's true that's that's what the society is all about.
Well, thanks, Ali, for taking some time for this interview, and good luck the rest of the season. Um, I, I expect you to make the playoffs this season now, so the Ducks will be flying to the playoffs, hopefully. That's what we're shooting for, one game at a time. Do the Belichick method, just one game at a time, but that's the goal. Awesome. Thanks again, Ali, and we'll talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Have a good night. Hey, socialites. We're interviewing head coach, the Denver Ninetales, Katie. Katie, thanks for joining us here on GPS tracking this week. So yet again, you are finding yourself at near the top of the league, you know, behind the one and only. You're in second place. Uh, what, what do you attribute your repeated success through all four seasons? of the society? No, I'd like to say it's a lot of research and training at the Pokemon, but I don't do that research. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know if I can do this, honey. <laughs> this is awkward. You're, you're making it awkward. I so know, those watching. I know. So, okay. Yeah. So you, you got no tips. You, you, you continue to be like one of the best teams, but you have no tips for the other teams, or you don't want to share anything because you're selfish. I think, all right, so what do I attribute my success to? I think one of the biggest things every season is I, I, I pick two Pokemon that I really like and I want to build my team around those two. So I try not to kind of overcomplicate my team. I think sometimes people get a little excited about all the different varieties they have or options when I think it's, in my personal opinion, better to have two solid Pokemon and build it around them so everything else supports them. So, and I really like the weather factor. So this is the third seed. I know you don't count snow as or ice as the weather, but I do. So this is the third season that I've used some sort of weather team. So I think, I think it's really fun to play with. And I think it's easy to kind of build your team around that aspect. So would you say this season that kind of like Tarantar Excadrill is the core of your team? Excadrill currently tied um, for the most KOs in the society with 17 this season? 100% and I think he is the most, by far the most KOs on my team, so. But do you feel like, so in that, sense then if somebody can just counter your kind of core two Pokemon do you feel like then you're at a big disadvantage well I did try to pick up the Italian in the hopes that I had another, at least another strong Pokemon on my team and I ha also have if I wanted to go slower and try to use Trick Room I have Meowstic, Punkeldor, and Vikavolt where I can try to do something with that I'm still trying to practice with that. I don't know if I 100% like that combination, but I do have backup choices that I can go with, especially if I don't want to bring the sand team, if I want to break it up and do something slightly different. But in general, I think the sand core is probably the strongest aspect of my team so far. All right. So you've been battling out the four seasons how do you feel the society's come along and how would you compare this current season with the past season i think this season's probably one of the most organized seasons which is very nice i think everybody's been a lot better about scheduling their matches with each other in like a timely fashion everybody you have more faces on the podcast which is nice the more teams you get i think the more variety you bring to the table and I love the minors division. I think it's a great opportunity for people to to kind of learn. So I do think there was a, a large skew in past seasons between people who are newer and people who are more experienced. And I know it must not be very fun if you just lose every single match. Like it doesn't make you want to come back. So I think having a minors division is good for people who want to play, but might not be as competitive as others. Yeah, so do you... Do you have any, um, other than what you've already said, do you have any tips for people playing in the minors this season? Um, I think practice with your Pokemon, like whether, you know, you can go the easy route and do the battle tower or 
make your way up in the rank battles. But I think if you just practice with your team, you will get better with that. You just need to, to use them and figure out the best move combinations that, you know, you'd like. Yeah. I I like uh, the website Peakalytics. You can, at least for doubles, you can get a lot of information on there, but they also do some stuff for singles as well. For people who mm -hmm. want to check that out, I link that website down in all of the uh, Pokemon Minute shorts. Definitely check those out. Well, Katie, Denver Ninetales, congrats on another great start to another season. Well, what do you think? You, you you going for the championship this season? I'm going to try to. You seem to always beat me every time. I can't seem to get you. I think you kind of get me uh, psyched out psyched out before a game happens. You get in my mind. Yeah. Well, we'll have to see. For those rooting for the Denver Ninetales, make sure you leave a comment. And as always, stay classy. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Katie. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the hot take segment of GPS Cracking, your segment where you get all the hot takes from all the coaches of the Global Pokemon Society on everything to do with Pokemon. And we got a doozy this week to kick it off in our first hot take of the new podcast format. Joining me is Justin, a.k.a. Juggernaut, head coach of the Australia R-Box, and Joe, a.k.a. Real Pokemon Joe, a.k.a. head coach of the Daytona Colossals. And we're going to have ourselves a lively debate on a few topics that are on fire right now in the Pokemon world setting it ablaze so gentlemen thank you for joining me are you guys ready for uh some fun debates here yeah definitely hey yo awesome so you guys know a couple of these topics ahead of time so you've been able to do a little bit of research but we're going to start off with a fun one uh i just want your guys thoughts and opinions on these first couple and then we'll get to the heavy hitter question at the end so, for those who are living under a rock, it is Pokemon's 25th anniversary, the silver anniversary, 25 years, and through everything, music, entertainment, the video games, the trading card games, of course, they're doing a bunch of stuff. So, guys, you don't have to stay to the trading card game, which is what most of this debate is going to be to, but for the 25th anniversary... So far, are you excited for it, or do you feel like Pokemon is letting you down as a fan? Joe, why don't you take this one first? Um, I would definitely have to say I'm excited for it, all aspects of it. I'm excited for the plushies that are come, that are out, came out, coming out. I'm excited for all the new card sets coming out that have came out and are coming out, and uh, I'm excited for the. You know, all the stuff that they haven't announced yet, but they said they're going to announce. So, I mean, we've already got Pokemon Snap. They're supposed to be going to remake of a game. Hopefully, because it's the silver year, it'll be, uh, you know, a remake of uh, Gold and Silver. Um, and other than that, you know, I'm excited for all that. However, I do understand that Pokemon Stance, where they also are going really mainstream with the whole Katy Perry and the virtual concerts and stuff like that. But you know what? Bring more eyes to the community. I'm all for it, as long as they're the right eyes. Justin? Yeah, Justin, um, how, do, how do you feel? Yeah, I like pretty much spot on with what Joe said. Like, um, the, the concerts with Katy Perry and the virtual Post Malone concert, I don't fully understand. I guess exactly like Joe said, it's just more eyes into the, the Pokemon brand, I guess, which, you know, hopefully isn't a bad thing. Um, but like sort of any exposure is expo good exposure, I guess. Um, super pumped up, like Joe said, Pokemon Snap 2. I'm so pumped up for that. Like I'd love that Pokemon Snap when I was a kid. Um, I love, you know, rather than like, you know, you've got Shining Fates, Battle Styles. Uh, like Joe said, there's something coming up that they haven't announced fully yet. Um, that's cool. But they're also doing the, uh, the Jumbo starter packs with all the starters from generations one to eight coming out every month uh, throughout the year um, so like it's a huge year for Pokemon and I think they're 
on the right track. Like they're bringing out so much awesome stuff. I can't wait to see if they've got anything else in the works they haven't let us know about, but so far it's looking like it's going to be a, a great year for Pokemon. Oh yeah. You think Ryan knows he's muted? There he is. No, I know. I was getting something else. I just wanted to kind of pull up this screen share here so people can see what Justin was talking about with the Shining Fates. Looking forward to that. That'll be coming out at least in the U.S. February 19th. Hopefully people can get their cards and everything for that fun set. All right, guys, so 25th anniversary. Seems like you're both pretty hyped about it. Um, definitely a lot to be hyped about. Still more to come, too, which always drives the hype train, the element of the unknown. But something that just came out recently that's making little kids cry, maybe. I don't know. But uh, Making me cry. <laughs> Pokemon and McDonald's have teamed up yet again for special Pokemon packs featuring all the starters. And yep, Joe's got a fistful of them right there. And people like Joe, Justin, myself, 30 year old, 40 year old grown men are kicking down McDonald's doors to get these packs. So guys, just real quick, your thoughts and opinions on the Pokemon McDonald's team up. Is it worth it for these adults to be getting it? Like, is there value to be held on these things? Like, do you speak about that, Justin? Um, so I'm not kicking down any McDonald's doors because they're not even out here yet. Um, but I think there's a. So I've seen on eBay, like, because I went searching for them just to see you know how many people are actually buying it to sell it for a profit and the day i think the day of it being you know starting to get sent out with meals in america people were selling like an entire sealed case of them um so it's like people trying to make money but like i, I saw somewhere um i was talking to a uh, a friend from america and he was saying 20 20th anniversary pokemon mcdonald's cards are worth like a dollar obviously you've got your exceptions like pikachu i mean i think I, the hype over it is probably a bit misguided i don't think it's i i think people maybe just want to make collect the set or you know there's obviously going to be people who just want to get it grade it flip it um and stuff like that so I think the the craziness over it is a little bit unnecessary, but I mean, it's sort of what Pokemon have become now. Like people are just going ballistic over Pokemon cards, especially something like a promo where it's not like a mainstream set. It's not going to be around for a long time. So I guess people are going crazy while they can. True. What, what do you think, Joe? Um, I, I, I definitely think that it's a great thing uh, for any collector to try and collect every set that's available. Um, I don't agree with the people that are flipping them for like seven, eight, nine, ten dollars a pack. That's ridiculous considering that there's what 30,000 McDonald's nationwide and there's only 15,000 Walmarts nationwide. So if every McDonald's as 3,000 uh, packs of Pokemon cards, then that means the rarity, the, the rarity of these is slim to none. There's bunches of them. Uh, Pikachu is seated one in every 25 packs. So these people going out and buying, you know, the entire case or buying out the stock, that's just ridiculous. Like keep in mind that these are for kids and mm. you know, the Happy Meal, you know, um, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous the way people are doing it and like justin said they don't hold much value more than the fact that you're a collector and you're saying i've collected this whole set you know financially 
Pokemon 50th anniversary, I have a feeling that the Pikachu card for 25th might go up to like $70, $80. But when you consider what value cards have in general, that's nothing. That's peanuts, you know? So I think it's a good thing that McDonald's is doing it. I think it's a great thing that they're pairing up with Pokemon as they've done every year for the last umpteen years, you know? Um, I just think, again, we'll get more into this during the big topic of the hot take, but you know, flippers are ruining it for everybody. So that's a good uh, kind of segue there, Joe. Um, yeah, definitely, I, I can agree with if you're a collector, then collect everything that you can, right? But uh, you brought up the death match, the, the big show, the highlight reel, you know, the headliner here. No one has set the Pokemon world asunder as this one person whose name I almost fear to utter. So like, <laughs> I'll say Voldemort more than I'll say this guy's name. <laughs> yes. wow. Logan Paul. Logan Paul. Is he good or bad for Pokemon? So we are going to have a debate here. Justin, you've decided to, this might not be your personal opinion, so I'm not, you know, disclaimer, <laughs> do not hold these people's <laughs> opinions to their personal opinion, but Justin is going to defend in the good that Logan Paul is good for Pokemon, and then Joe is going to rebuttal that he is bad for Pokemon and then I'll let Justin if he wants to make some remarks to anything Joe says uh, get a second word in there but Justin I'm going to let you lead off with that yeah so, so uh, as Ryan said this isn't my personal opinion this is coming from me being a business owner if you're Sort of have if you're not really familiar with me um i do run a card shop here in australia an online card shop uh, here in australia <laughs> i'm just looking at the stats so his last um his last break when he did a first edition booster box break so he bought a first edition booster box broke the entire everyone could buy a pack obviously 36 packs so um he sold them for eleven thousand dollars each I think I can't remember how many viewers were on during the stream, but that video is four months old and has 11 million uh, views. He's just released a video a week ago where he spent another two million dollars on first edition boxes. So he's bought a bunch more, um, which he's going to be opening. That's got 4.7 million views. So looking at it like as a business owner dealing with Pokemon cards those like I'm in Australia so those numbers may not apply specifically to me but it's bringing people into the hobby I guess you want to call it or bringing it into the Pokemon brand or the Pokemon name um, I guess if that's for lack of a better word um, so from the way I look at it like my like even just traffic through my website and people inquiring about products since since logan did that initial break up until like like even this very day like the amount of inquiries and and sales and everything that i'm getting through my website has gone up so much more than i anticipated like it's the price of so many things has gone up so much and it's just it's awesome having like like i only got back into pokemon in 2019 um, i was 13 when base set came out so i've been out of it for a long time and like a lot of his demographic is probably the same age as a lot not demographic a lot of his audience sorry is probably fairly close to the same age as the three of us so a lot of us grew up with pokemon and you know maybe it was just sort of in the back of our minds like we didn't really think too much of it like you know oh pokemon it is I used to love that when i was a kid it's bringing it back into the forefront of their mind and like 
holy shit, like, I used to love this when I was a kid, like, you know, ever since I got back into Pokemon, like, just seeing how much Pokemon has evolved since I was 13, I'm 35 next week, so just seeing how much it's evolved is just crazy, like, it's, and it's people like him who have done that, like, 11 million people may not have been brought back into Pokemon, um, He's got like 20 something. Hold on, let me check how many subscribers he's actually got as well. Um, he's got 22.8 million subscribers. So that's potential to bring so much more people into this community. It's a great community. Like, you know, whether you're watching TCG content creators, VGC content creators, um, you know, anything really. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's an awesome community. Like, there's some great people involved with it. Um, so, from a business perspective, it's great. It's bringing so many like old faces back into this, uh, back into the brand. And so, I think uh, from a business perspective, he's he's great for it. Like he's done not just me, but like anybody who has a license to sell Pokemon cards and anyone who's just selling Pokemon cards, um, he's done like absolute like great things for for everyone who's got to deal with it really that's what i think some good points justin joe your response why is logan paul bad for pokemon well i'll give my disclaimer and start off with the fact that uh as far as you're right, financially for the Pokemon company, he is great for business. However, being a collector and not a business owner and a PokeTuber and somebody that's been into Pokemon for, let's see, I'm 37 now, so about two thirds of my life, you know, we used to go to the store and just buy booster packs. Okay, as an example, before Logan Paul did his video, you can find XY Evolutions, you can find Steam Siege, Crimson Invasion, you know, you can find XY packs all day long. You can find Sun and Moon packs all day long. You can find box sets that came out months, months, months ago. You could find them there. Now, after little videos, you go in and stores are bare. There's um, just, wow that's going to bring me to one of my points as well um from a collector standpoint though it, it's terrible for us it's, it's terrible for people that can't find product now from a moral standpoint which is where i come in is the fact that yes he disrespected japanese culture he dressed up in a pikachu outfit he danced around ran through crowds threw giant stuffed balls at people he uh he went to the suicide forest and showed like a dead body hanging and made jokes and stuff you know not only is he embarrassing the pokemon culture but he's embarrassing americans as well and uh you know it's just it, it's is this the face that you want representing your company like is the pokemon company happy with this you know then turns around he disappears for all this time he comes back and he does the box break thing, you know, true. He did all that for charity. I'll give him that. He did all that for charity. But in his video, he stated, you know, um, this is where the money's at, guys. Pokemon cards. He even put out a tweet stating how flipping cards is the way to get money. You know, it's, it's all about money, 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 money. And, you know, not to sound religious or anything, but every culture in the world talks about how money is the root of all evil. And that's what this is. It's all about money. As an example, before he bought the two hundred, the two hundred and six thousand dollar booster box, they were being sold at one hundred and twenty thousand dollar each. After it, they're up to over two hundred thousand. So you know the price is like it's called artificial inflation between him and the guy he introduced in his show, the collectible guru. You know those two people alone, all they've done is they've given out false numbers. They they told people. You know, what did he say that the Blastoise was worth, or I'm sorry, the Bulbasaur was worth $30,000 when it was actually only worth $3,000. You know, <laughs> that artificial inflation is why it's good for business because people are paying for stuff that they don't know the actual cost of it just because Logan Paul said it was cool. Now, um, <laughs> yeah, 
How do you get blood on his nose? Yeah. Oh, that's when he punched. Hard. That that's when he punched the glass because of the uh, the the fake it, ones. But that was all. Fake. But uh, yeah. So uh, the last thing I want to say is I want to mention that you had pointed out that he brings more eyes on the product, and you're 100 percent correct. The problem is he's bringing the wrong eyes on the product. He's bringing the eyes of the people that were going to the store and collecting, you know, baseball cards, football cards, people doing that. And they buy them, they flip them, they sell them on eBay, commercial or uh, flea markets, garage sales, whatever. And the, he's bringing them to the product. Those are the people that didn't touch Pokemon cards. Those are the people that don't even know what a Charizard is. They just know it's the little dragon looking dude that sells for 500 bucks, you know? Um, and so here's just a quick story. I know my time's running short, but here's just a quick story. I actually had a girl that my wife works with post on Facebook that her son wanted to get into Pokemon because her cards at McDonald's. She went back to McDonald's. They were sold out completely. So she said, where do I get cards? And somebody told her, why don't you go to Walmart? She went to Walmart, no cards. This kid almost completely missed out on Pokemon because his mom couldn't find cards anywhere, which could have, she could have been like, Oh, well, here's these Yu-Gi-Oh's or whatever those little top things are that um, uh, Skaz Down Under is always opening. You know, he could have completely been turned off of Pokemon. And now you're talking about the future of the business because once the once the flipper phase is done, once the 25th anniversary is done, now you're going to have the kids not getting into it. And that's now, uh, that's the slow nickel you're losing out on because you enjoyed that fast dollar. And so I ended up giving the kid a whole bunch of my cards. Like I gave him an entire ETB full of just all sword and shield base set, commons, uncommons, rares, hollows, things like that. I gave him uh, 90 uh, energy cards, coins, all that stuff, just so that this kid could get into the hobby. And like I said, he's bringing eyes to it. He's just bringing the wrong eyes to it. And that is gonna cause the right eyes to get turned away. Justin, do you have a rebuttal to any of Joe's remarks? Um, so I think the saying the wrong eyes, he, uh, him bringing the wrong eyes, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a harsh claim because not, ev not everybody that's come is, has that, that agenda of I'm just buying cards to make money. It's, you know, like, I don't watch, I personally don't watch Logan Paul. So I, it's not like if I wasn't into Pokemon, I could say, yeah, he brought me back into, into the hobby. Um, but there will be people uh, who are genuinely interested in Pokemon, in the hobby, who, who are a collector um, and who are, they're not trying, they're, buying cards with the intention of collecting they're not trying to invest to make money 12 18 you know two years down the track they're here they're collecting because you know the nostalgia it brings them um the the flipper thing obviously with all the the eyes that he is bringing it is obviously going to bring people who are in it for the money and i mean that's going to happen with everything um but one thing I'll just, uh, I'll read it out. Pokemon tweeted out something. Um, we're aware that some, some fans are experiencing difficulties purchasing certain TCG products due to very high demand. In response, we are reprinting impacted products at maximum capacity to ensure more fans can enjoy the Pokemon TCG. So while there obviously is a supply issue due to scalpers, due to you know, whatever it may be, it, it, I'm not going to deny that it's due to scalpers because, let's face it, for the majority of the part, it, it, it is due to them. Um, like, I was a Pokemon content creator myself, and I can't find anything, um, which is sort of why I've stopped. But this is, this is good news. Like, not only are they reprinting more, but there's news of them uh, building more printing facilities. I think it was over the next 18 months from memory. Um, I could be wrong in saying that. Um, but I think there is an issue with being able to buy cards from a content creator standpoint. But Pokemon, and it's taken them a, a, a while, but they're seeing this now. They're seeing that there is an, an issue 
with supply and you know this isn't an issue that's going to be fixed overnight they're not going to be able to you know flick a magic switch and you know all the river voltage darkness ablaze champions path and everything else you couldn't find is going to magically be available on the shelves obviously there's a production uh you know manufacturing process to it all but they're definitely going in in the right direction to fix uh this issue i'm not going to call it a problem because you know, i'm coming from a business perspective it's it's great for business um so it it'll be good once they fix their um supply issue and i think that's one of the biggest problems at the moment like you know whether you're a scalper or not you've got a budget like everyone you know like if if a sh shop's only getting four of one box that's not a massive outlay but that's they might not be printing enough for stores to get double triple the amount this is going to fix that hopefully i can't i can't say for certain it's going to fix because i don't work for pokemon um but this is going to fix that and you know everyone's got a limit like people aren't gonna oh wow there's 50 of these boxes now i can't afford all that i'm not going to buy all that i'm going to have to leave some so they're definitely taking a step in the right direction to uh fix fix their supply thing. so see how that goes hopefully hopefully it goes well yeah that's a good point there is always when the demand is high, the best way to counteract that is to have the supply be higher. Um, Joe, any last quick remarks on what Justin just said? Um, I do agree with you to a standpoint, but I don't blame Pokemon, and I really don't blame the flippers either. I blame the retailers for not putting, you know, <laughs> stipulations. Um, a lot of retailers have stepped up recently. Um, I've heard mm -hmm. stories of targets telling people that they have to get them from the electronics department. Um, one guy at uh, Gengar Blaze on YouTube, uh, he actually was telling me a story one night about how he um, went to Walmart and they told him, okay, we're putting this stuff out, but each person gets one of this and one other item. And it was the Hidden Fates ETBs. And a guy literally like flipped his wig, like I'm supposed to get 10. Do you know how much money you're costing me? And it's like, you know, between the vendors giving their friends inside information, yo, I'm about to get these boxes in, you know, make sure you meet me up at the store. And then the retailers allowing them to just clear the shelves off. That's where the problem is. You know, these people, if, if, if Justin was to go and buy 10 ETBs of hidden fates and he sold them for $150 each and only paid $55 each US American dollars for, you know, Aussie. But uh, so, you know, if he was to do all that, then he could sell them for 200, 300 American dollars as much as he wants to. And it's up to the person buying it. But the fact that you go into, not you, but they go into Walmart and they buy them for $55 each and they buy 10 of them. You know, if Pokemon puts out 20, every 10 they buy, they can buy three more. Buying 20 is not gonna be nothing for them. They just went from buying 10 to buying 20. You know, if Pokemon sends them 40, yeah, they might have a limit at that point. And they might be like, yeah, you know, but what the idea behind printing more is, is to flood the market, causing them to drop in value. And that's really what Pokemon's doing because they want the attention to be for the kids, not for the money. And the kids, you know, the people coming back into the hobby, the collectors, the players, the, you know, the TCG online people that just buy them for the code cards, which is dumb because they're cheaper on the actual game. But, uh, you know, so that's, that, like I said, I can't solely blame Logan Paul. I just feel like Logan Paul bringing this collectible guru dude into the thing and telling everybody to flip Pokemon cards is what set the ball in motion. And that's what artificially inflated the prices. That's why a Steam Siege booster box, Steam Siege, the worst set ever created probably, other than Champion's Path, is going for almost $250 for a booster box. Before Logan Paul, it was like 110. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's ridiculous. It, it's ridiculous. And so like I said, I'm not solely blaming Logan Paul, but he didn't help. He definitely didn't help. So he's not good. He's bad and i get one f bomb so fuck logan paul hey, <laughs> yeah and and real quick i just want to say joe because you brought up uh i know my local walmart um this past weekend i noticed that they are limiting to um basically 
two Pokemon products per person. Not that there was anything on the shelf anyway, but you know, <laughs> there there was a sign there. So I can only assume it was in good faith. So yeah. thank you guys for joining me for this first big debate. Uh, this is what our viewers can expect for hot takes. Also, we'll have some just rants and some, you know, cuts and as Joe would say, some like promo cuts going on if you're a wrestling fan. So <laughs> definitely stay tuned for all that. Thanks for checking out this hot take. So welcome back, socialites. I'm joined this week by Juan, head coach. The Worcester Deli Birds, Juan, you've taken this past season off um, with some personal issues, but you have been still in the society helping with the rules. Um, you've been in, involved in the Discord, a lot of stuff. So I just want to kind of pick your brain. We're halfway through season four. What have you seen this season? What are like the stories to watch? What are the teams, the coaches that have caught your eyes? What should those watching the society be excited for or keep their eye on? Two words. Mighty Psyducks. Wow. Who would ever thought the Psyducks would be three and one? I remember watching, I don't, maybe a couple podcasts ago or where you guys were taking bets about how many wins the Psyducks would get. I believe you said three. And he's at three right now. So I want to ask you, do you think he can win more? Uh, let me actually pull up his schedule real quick because that is a good question. Um, let's take a quick look at that. Because he's hot right now. I mean, yeah, he- it's... Yeah, he's running hard right now. So he's going up against Vero this week. I think he, he can win that. Yeah. Tuscaloosa, I think, is 50-50. Tuscaloosa hasn't really been uh, living up to the hype on their return season. Um, so I, I I call that like a coin toss. Drip Bale, I also think is coin toss. I think he's starting to change some stuff around, but we'll have to see like by that point. And Ali's going to be really motivated to uh, beat Cole. Um, yeah. The yeah. Stuff that Cole has said kind of motivated him. <laughs> so, you know, so maybe I'll say that he's favored in this one. So I think he'll have the extra motivation. But And then this last game will be pretty tough. But I think he can easily get like a couple more wins out of here. Like easily, so I'm gonna say he probably ends with like five wins this season and gets into the playoffs pretty comfortably. What What do you think, Juan? I think he has a chance to take three out of four. Wow, there you go. That'd be something. Because Pittsburgh is wow. I mean, they're doing really good, and so I think that's gonna be tough. But I think Vero, like you said, that's a winnable game. Tuscaloosa hasn't been the Tuscaloosa from season two. And Triff fail, no offense to Cole, yeah, that's a winnable game for him as well. Yeah. Uh, I think Cole just can't figure out what Sableye, what he wants to do with Sableye. And I was saying that in my match, it's kind of like a three versus one, or a three versus four, I mean, when he brings Sableye. Because I, I feel like it's just not doing enough for him. But anyway, what uh, you you brought up Pittsburgh as well. What what have you thought about the new coaches overall? Pittsburgh, Miami, Tokyo, El Paso. Some of them we haven't gotten to see too much as far as like recording battles, but yeah, El Paso. I, I don't recall seeing many battles, but um, I know in Discord, Miami. I mean that. G Max Moltres is that's a problem and he's doing pretty well. Pittsburgh is doing really good. And Tokyo with Tokyo, I think the problem is maybe lack of support Pokemons. 
I remember when I first drafted season two, my team was way too physical. And when I did that mid-season trade to get some support mods, my whole season turned around. So I think Tokyo yeah. might have to look, maybe get some more support mods because, I don't know, to me, support mods are just as dangerous or even more dangerous on doubles than just a powerhouse. Yeah, for sure. It, it's always good to have like at least a couple on your team for different situations, I feel. Yeah. Our look at Orange Guru, what, what Orange Guru did in the last battle there for Reno. I mean, it goes to show you. Or Jinx. <laughs> yeah. Kisses everywhere. Kisses everywhere, that whore. See, and that's the thing. Like, in singles, Jinx, you don't really think about Jinx, but, I mean, you're, you're going to make people start thinking about Jinx. <laughs> Because now people are going to have to figure out how do they take her out before they're all asleep. Yeah. And it, it's tough because she gets fake out. Like, she she's fast. You know, she can't be taunted. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to... There's, there's some stuff to think about. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I've been impressed with the, with the new coaches who have joined. I think they've definitely shown um, that they can hang with... Uh, most of the majors uh tokyo i think will figure some stuff out so we'll have to see if they can get a few wins towards the latter half of the season but what what are your uh so we're halfway through one what do you think the playoff picture is looking at you kind of mentioned like pittsburgh reno what are like maybe your top four or five teams that you think are kind of putting themselves in the position for the championship this season I'll give you a top five. Of course, you, the Boston Braveries. <laughs> Denver Ninetales, she's always in the mix. Um, Charm City Charizard, that's another story there. I mean, what a turnaround from season two. Um, Zach's definitely figured it out. Um, Pittsburgh, I think, is going to be there. And I'm going to go on a limb and say Mighty Psyducks. I Whoa. think they're, they're hot right now. I, I think Ali, I think Cole might regret ever uh, motivating Ali because I, I don't know. It's it's so great to see something like that. Like for a team like Tokyo, like to look at Charm City and Psyducks, like it just takes something to turn things around. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, it do doesn't take a lot in Pokemon to uh, make the matchups favorable. You know, stuff stuff swap, swaps really fast, and if you can find what works for you and just let it go, uh, you know, you you can definitely do a lot. So overall. Um, you know, Juan, you've been part of three seasons now since season two. Um, you've probably heard stuff about season one. So as far as like the overall feel and how the season's going, how would you rank this season um, overall for the society, especially like with the minors and everything involved as well? Uh, do you think it's like, where, where would you rank it, right? Like, I think this is the best season so far. Um, it's unfortunate I'm not a part of it battling, but um, the society is just getting growing and the competitive is, you know, it's there. The people are getting better. You know, who would have thought that Charm City and Side Ducks would be where they are now a couple seasons ago. Um, I just, it's just, I think it's just going to keep getting better and better each each season. So I would rank this one as the best, just because all the storylines, you know, the Psyduck's probably being the most interesting storyline. Yeah, for sure. So there, there's, a, there's definitely a lot going on. So hopefully, you know, we, we keep, uh, keep this season hype up. And like you said, every season we're 
trying to grow, trying to do better. Um, I'm hoping you'll be able to get back into the fray next season. So we'll, we'll have to see. You know, you you de- you deserve to be duking it out there against <laughs> the rest of us. So thanks for joining right. me, Juan, and uh, we'll have you on again real soon. All right. Thanks for having me.